Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So we were talking about what happens to the Bunsen burner at the tip because uh, what we found about the flame, the, the flame uh, stabilization was largely speaking we are now talking about like the shoulder of the flame where you have the normal component of the flow velocity tries to balance the flame speed um, that is normal to the uh, flame itself and therefore the flame shapes itself corresponding to that. But that is true uh, for most of the shoulder of the flame but if you now think about what happens to the tip no matter what the flame speed flow velocity balance is the tip also always has to actually uh, propagate uh, uh, against the flow directly right. So which means no matter what the flow speed is and how the flame speed is able to balance that the tip always has to adjust itself to match the flow speed to the extent it can right. So question is how does that happen right. So what we find is uh, we now have to think about think about a, a locally highly curved flame there and then see what happens when you now have a flame that is so curved out there and therefore what we want to do is uh, think about flame curvature and also another aspect of it that we need to worry about called the flow divergence effect. Um, in the context of a small perturbation to a plane flame. So if you now begin to think about a nominally plane flame that is propagating against a propagating with a flame velocity SL superscript naught all right which means in a flame fixed coordinate system you have your um, uh, reactants unburnt reactants coming in into the flame at SL superscript naught then let us now think about what happens when you now perturb the flame about this point okay and this particular picture here uh, shows a couple of things one is you, you have one part of the flame that is um, curved convex um, against the incoming flow and the other part of the flame is curved concave relative to the incoming flow we need to think about what happens with these two parts. Um, separately but we should probably come to the same conclusion either way. So typically uh, in the classroom if you explain what is happening to the concave convex part in the exam you can you can expect a question of what happens to the concave part right. So uh, so you should be able to think about this uh, just, just as well. What we want to talk about here is actually uh, two process two set, two different kinds of processes that are that that that, that uh, come about when you have this kind of curvature one is uh, a thermal so one is a thermal diffusive imbalance or balance or imbalance depending upon uh, what, what really happens. Um, so one of the things that, that, that happens is when you now have a flame that is curved uh, let us now take the con concave part this is a little bit more intuitive and it is also kind of like what is happening in the Bunsen flame tip so uh, th this is pretty instructive. When you are now thinking about a curvature which is now beginning to be off the order of not exactly equal to but off the order of which means still a little greater than the flame thickness okay. Now so keep in mind what is meant by flame thickness the flame thickness includes the preheat zone and the reaction zone and the preheat zone is where the upstream heat conduction and downstream species diffusion happens along with convection superposed on for, for both the uh, species mass as well as the enthalpy. What we are now beginning to see is if you now have a curvature like this then beyond what is being heated up with to, to, for the cold reactants you now have a focused effect of heating the reactants. So this conduction now becomes multidimensional the heat conduction becomes multidimensional and therefore you are now actually um, heating the reactants significantly more than if the flame were planar. 
this should actually give rise to a tendency for the flame speed to increase all right. Now on the other hand look at what is happening to the, the species diffusion the species diffusion now is going to actually go radially outward so typically when you are looking at something like a fuel lean flame for example then the, the deficient species says deficient reactant is fuel in a fuel lean situation and when you are now trying to have this uh, that so that it is more critical to think about the deficient reactant so the deficient reactant now spreads thinner across in a, in a radially outward manner so instead of actually feeding a planar flame straight it is actually spreading itself thin that means the flame is running out of the deficient reactant more than in the case of a planar flame if you have a uh, concave curvature relative to the upstream right. So this has a tendency to decrease the flame speed all right so you now have a possible balance between uh, these two these two effects that will tell you whether the curvature is going to stay or grow or decay. So when you now have to think about a balance between heat conduction and species diffusion what comes to our minds it is a Lewis number right. So we have to think about what the Lewis number is and depending upon what the Lewis number is okay. So if you now have a, a, a Lewis number that is greater than 1 right. So if you now have a Lewis number that is greater than 1 that means the heat conduction upstream right is more than the mass diffusion downstream right that means the the species depletion effect is not going to be as significant as the the focused sheet conduction which which means that the flame is actually going to propagate more vigorously or or there is going to be a net effect of increase in the flame speed all right so if you now think about what is happening at the tip of the flame for a greater than unity lewis number right we expect a more intense burning an increased flame speed that can try to match the flow speed there all right for a greater than lewis the um, greater than unity lewis number but if you now have a for in the bunsen burner tip right the bunsen burner tip for le less than 1 you now have a a greater extent of dif deficient species depletion that is happening when compared to the extent of upstream heat conduction. So the flame is essentially running out of reactant even if it is trying hard to conduct, conduct heat upstream to heat up whatever is remaining of the reactants. So this leads to this could lead okay so could lead to a local flame extinction. All right. Now many times uh, I should not say many times uh, sometimes uh, you do see flames which have a hole in the middle so that means you now have a flame that keeps going up like this instead of turning around it actually goes up like that and see, see that I am actually drawing it with the lighter line that is simply because the flame fades as it goes along that, that indicates like a a lesser burning intensity progressively and the extinction there all right so you now have a hole in the flame it is not as if like it you need to have le less than 1 for for this hole in the flame there is also one more thing that we have to think about so the first thing that we talked about was the thermal diffusive imbalance um, thermal hyphen diffusive imbalance the second thing that we have to worry about is the uh, uh, the density jump okay so uh, density
the density, density jump across the frame. So what is the consequence of having a, um, a decrease in density for the products relative to the reactants when the flow gets past the flame, right? Any ideas here? What is going to happen? If the flow now tries to go past, so we will try to still go through, go through the same idea that is you now have a nominally flat flame with a SL naught but then now you are beginning to think about the fact that the density of the products is going to be less than the density of the reactants and perturb the flame to be non planar all right. So as a consequence of the density difference local mass balance dictates that the velocity should compensate for it all right. So if you now think about a point here. Uh, along along a curved flame, um, what we are basically saying is you now have a let us suppose that your uh, this is your um, U naught, and uh, what you want to do is try to decompose this as parallel and perpendicular to the flame, right? So this is U n naught and this is u t naught and what happens is when you try to have a uh, flow that is going uh, past the flame it is mainly the normal component that suffers the expansion because that is how we are normally thinking about a flame. So if, if you had a unperturbed flame with, with, with a, with a uh, with a uh, flat uh, profile then what you are basically saying is the normal component of the flow is going to actually expand right. So what we then what we then have to expect is we need to have the normal component increase significantly this is significant because what we are talking about is a constant pressure more or less a constant pressure system all right and you have to think about what is the density change because of the density changes because of the temperature change. So the temperature rises therefore the density falls right. So what is the temperature rise like so if you take like a 300 K over here and let us say it is reasonable to expect something like a 2400 K there right. So that is about a temperature rise of about 8 fold can be 2100, 2400, 2700 okay, think in terms of factors of 3 or uh, 300. Uh, for, for, for the sake of simplicity right uh, 3000 so you are now talking about a factor that is somewhere between 7 to 10 times more all right. So this has to be significant and, and then so the density correspondingly decreases right so P equals rho RT and as T increases rho has to decrease and then rho naught u naught is equal to rho infinity u infinity or more specifically in this case rho naught u n naught should be equal to rho infinity u n infinity right. So if rho naught over rho infinity is going to be about a factor of 7 or 8 or 9 then u n infinity is going to be that much higher when compared to u n naught right. So it would be okay if we extended this line even more like this particular uh, vec curve that I, that I drew was only about 3 times so let us just exaggerate a little bit more it is still not an exaggeration and uh, so this should actually be your ut uh, sorry un infinity right and the ut naught gets preserved as such when you now want to locate your u um, t infinity because that does not really suffer any expansion and then so what happens to the resultant. So the resultant now obviously gets tilted more towards the normal of the flame all right. So this is basically then your u infinity this is the picture you would like to see so what is it what essentially is happening it essentially means that if you now have a streamline that is coming like this it is going to get compressed right. So if you have a streamline that, 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 that goes like here it is going to go together but obviously streamlines cannot hit each other 
right they try to turn and in trying to turn and accommodate each other they try to disturb the streamlines that are, are that are approaching the flame as well okay so you now get into a situation where your streamlines should actually turn out to be in 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 reality uh, somewhat like this it starts bending outward in anticipation of having to converge again further down right and correspondingly if you now look at this kind of a curvature which is what is pertinent for us in a Bunsen burner tip right. So we expect that the flame should actually increase sorry the flow should actually increase or diverge and then converge back again I am sorry uh, made a mistake. right so look at what is going on here you have a situation where you are thinking that you want to have a flame that is stabilized at SL naught right now this is what is equal to u locally here that means you always this is very important I think I think I mentioned this earlier the way we always want to think about flames and I will re reiterate this when we are dealing with triple flames um, after doing diffusion flames the way we always want to think about a flame propagation speed is always relative to the flow speed far upstream of the flame. That means you do not want to worry about all this mess you have to say it, it all depends on it all boils down to how much do I have to open the valves for my flow to actually set in so that the flame is approximately stabilized. What is meant by approximate is it is stationary there I can actually have a flame fixed coordinate system what it is doing within the flame fixed coordinate system is not of concern to me so long as it is there right and what is the flow speed at which it is there is what is the flame speed is what I would like to think about right. So if I want to now say that this is what it is then what is the problem that is happening near the flame you now find that the, the flow is locally accelerated when you now have a flame that is curved concave relative to the uh, far upstream reactants all right. So the, the what has essentially happened is the flame has now induced the flow to go faster at it when it, when it when it tries to have a concave curvature right and this means the flame needs to actually try to compensate for a higher level of increase in um, flame speed which should be by a mechanism that we talked about here if it has to survive if not it is going to actually cause a local extinction right. So we see this actually happening in a, in, a, in a Bunsen burner for example when you now talk about a streamlined path that is approaching the flame you now know that know for a fact that you now have a, uh, a streamlined path that goes like this. So you do have a a flow that is actually getting diverged uh, uh, for most part and then that continues to happen uh, over here but locally it tries to actually uh, squeeze in and then diverge. So effectively what happens is you need to have to take into account the effect of flow divergence on the uh, the planar flame speed so if you want to think about this effect you want to try to actually bring this into bring this into modifying the planar flame speed such that all this is like a black box and 
the, the, if you now had a planar flame speed, how is it going to be modified in a, in a way that will take into account the local flow deceleration or acceleration all right. So there is a way uh, by which you can do this, I am um, not going to derive this, uh, it is a little bit it's quite beyond uh, the scope of this particular uh, course but we will just state these things. So if you now assume constant properties. constant properties um, the flame speed is modified as SL equals SL not minus SL not script L kappa plus script L n hat dot divergence or n hat dot gradient v vector dot n hat. So here the SL naught is basically the unstretched flame, it does not suffer from the flame curvature and flow divergence effects. But SL is actually the flame speed that you would that you would have to use for a flame that is curved and also induces a flow divergence correspondingly and therefore alters the flame speed as well right. So here kappa then is the flame curvature right uh, so that is equal to divergence of n hat which is nothing but negative of uh, divergence of uh, grad g divided by mod grad g in the framework of the g equation and so of course you can now try to do a chain rule uh, differentiation here. So this is del square g divided by mod grad g plus um, grad mod grad g times grad g divided by mod grad g squared which is uh, minus del square g plus n hat dot uh, grad mod grad g divided by mod grad g. Keep in mind we are, we are actually trying to find the flame shape okay and the flame shape is now contained in the flame flame speed okay. So previously we were trying to find the flame shape based on the unstretched flame speed right but now we have to use a stretched flame speed which depends on the shape and the shape depends on the speed. So you will have to do an iterative solution of this and it is possible and there are, there are solutions that can be uh, made available uh, for, for these things. L here the script L is what is called as the Mark Stein's length and recall I kept talking about a, a length scale that is of the order of the flame thickness but not exactly equal so it is somewhat greater okay it is a little bit greater than the flame thickness because if you now have a flame curvature the heating effect is going to be felt a little bit further upstream than the original unstretched flame thickness okay. So previously the unstretched flame thickness contained the preheat zone but now if you curve like let us say concave uh, the heating is going to be felt further out right. So uh, that is kind of like the mark mark chain's length we are talking about. So it is a, a, a quantity of the order of the flame thickness f 
flame thickness and of course we know that the flame thickness delta depends on the flame speed this we did long ago right so the first time we started talking about the structure of uh, the premix flame the mass balance in the preheat zone resulted in something like this okay but here keep in mind this delta is actually for the stretched flame thickness the SL is actually the stretched flame speed okay and what we are now saying is this depends on L okay and uh, uh, so, so how does L depend on the delta so there is a uh, derivation for this again which we would which we would not go through but I will just state for uh, large activation energy of uh, uh, of a one step chemical reaction right so within, within the framework of assuming a one step chemical reaction with a large activation energy for it um, L over delta script L over delta is 1 over gamma natural logarithm 1 minus sorry 1 over 1 minus gamma plus beta Lewis number minus 1 divided by 2 1 minus gamma divided by gamma uh, integral 0 gamma divided by 1 minus gamma natural logarithm 1 plus x divided by x dx uh, evidently x is a dummy variable of integration from 0 to gamma over 1 minus gamma gamma is now not the ratio of specific heats that you are used to in gas dynamics this is actually the ratio of temperatures which is basically a temperature difference divided by the initial temperature and beta is our Zeldovich number. So it is Ea times Tf minus T0 divided by Ru Tf squared. So you can see that uh, gamma is actually embedded in here you could say Tf minus T0 divided by T0 is gamma. So E, e over Rut uh, Rutf times gamma would be your beta. Now typically it is found that uh, typically L over delta is uh, 2 to 6. So there are analysis uh, so what, what, you, what you will see, see is now if you want to try to actually find a curved flame shape it is quite difficult it is more getting more involved your um, mock chain's length depends on the uh, flame flame thickness the flame thickness depends on the flame speed the flame speed depends on the mock chain's length and so on. So there is like a loop within a loop that is going on here which we have to solve iteratively uh, there are analysis where we would just assume a constant mock chain's length let us not worry about so you, you pick a number between between this because it is it is about a variable that varies within this range. So let us not worry about it is the attitude uh, for, for those analysis. So then what happens as I said you see as the flame speed increases if you now go back to the tip of the Bunsen burner that that is what we were concerned with. Uh, if you now keep on increasing the uh, flow speed right. Um, as it is the uh, flame speed in this case the, the flame speed for the unstretched flame is less than the flow speed okay and the flow speed or, or put another way the flow speed is actually greater than the unstretched flame speed and at the tip because you now have a concave curvature the flow tends to actually converge and actually increase faster the flow faster that means the flame, flame speed has to increase much more to counter that and that would be through the thermal diffusive imbalance all right and that is obviously possible mainly when you have a uh, Lewis number greater than 1 but still since this effect is countering that uh, even when you have a Lewis number greater than 1 you could have conditions of local extinction right. So, 
So as the uh, as the as the flow rate is progressively increased, right? The uh, flame shoulder adjusts its orientation but but the tip can't the tip always has to stay as the tip it can't adjust the uh, adjust its orientation to, to the flow flow velocity therefore uh, this this results in uh, local extinction regardless of uh, of any whether it's whether it's greater than 1 or less than 1 and so on fine what next we talked about the bonzen banner we realized that at the shoulder of the flame the the flow normal component of the flow velocity should match the flame speed for the flame propagating perpendicular to itself then we realized that that is not as simple a situation as the tip so we went through what we needed to go through to think about the tip and it we found that it is not so straightforward you have to worry about these effects two effects mainly the thermal diffusive imbalance and the density variation effect density change with temperature effect. So all these things are involved in explaining what is going on at the tip but what about the base right. So what is going on at the base when we did the G equation we made an assumption that our zeta should be equal to 0 at R equals capital R that was like a boundary condition that we had adopted okay basically saying that the flame is touching the rim of the burner. Of course within the framework of the G equation we do not bring into effect the thickness of the flame all right so it is as if like the flame is having a thickness and we are basically saying that the SL is a constant it does not change and therefore we do not have to also worry about a varying thickness of the flame near the near the base and or, or, or and or, or a varying flame speed as we approach the base right but none of these things is true. So we need to now focus a little bit more on what is happening near the base and see what is the fate of the flame speed as we approach the uh, uh, base as well as the flow is not uniform either right. So we, we, we tend to think that you have a uniform flow that is approaching the flame and you have a uniform flame a constant flame speed with which the flame is uh, trying to attack the reactant flow and therefore you have a shape but that was not the case for the flow as well the flow was not uniform there it is coming out of a burner and it has to satisfy no slip boundary condition that means the flow velocity has to start from 0 right so we tend to begin to think wait a minute if you are going to have a zero flow velocity there that means the flame should be able to propagate against the flow right there along the walls and never really be stabilized above the above the burner on the one hand it looks like the flame has to actually not be held at the uh, burner at all and maybe get pushed up by the flow but if you now begin to look at the flow right it looks like the flame has to go deep in what is going on right. So let us so this, this, this idea of having to look at the base of the flame takes us to what the, the, the issue of what is called as flame stabilization. Flame stabilization. So this is this refers to the fate of the flame base, flame base or flame anchor point, flame stabilization uh, can also be referred to as flame anchoring 
because the base is the one that is actually holding the flame. So correspondingly you can also use the term flame holding right so flame holding, flame anchoring, flame stabilization all these things refer to pretty much the same and it deals with the fate of the flame base because the base is where the flame is held right. So we need to look at so what we what we just said was we need to look at SL and U variation as you approach the burner rim. Approach the burner rim, right? So let us look at the flow velocity variation that is simpler. So flow velocity u okay. So what we expect is if you now have a burner we, we, we have a no slip boundary condition all right and of course you could quibble saying we do not know exactly how the flow was formed and where and how is it developing as it reached a fully developed profile do we have an entrance length of associated with it and so on those things are not very very relevant okay. So even in, the, in, a, in a worst case where you assume like a fully developed flow that is emerging out of the uh, of the tube right and uh, we are talking, talking about laminar flames so we are, we are looking at a laminar uh, flow laminar fully developed flow that is coming out of the tube we expect a parabolic velocity profile. But what matters to us is what is happening here right. So this basically means that we are looking at <laughs> now what, what we drew as a line has suddenly become not a thick block I am I am even exaggerating and going further into saying that this is almost like a semi. Um, semi semi infinite solid filling one quadrant and with the corner here corresponding to that burner rim and the flow velocity is locally linear that is your u. So when we said that we wanted to look at the flame speed and the flow velocity variation as you approach the burner rim we picked the flow velocity because the flow velocity is always going to be somewhat linearly increasing from the rim inwards towards the center of the tube. So that is more like a monotonic variation you increase the flow speed the slope is going to increase if you decrease the flow speed the, the slope is going to decrease that is all right. So there is no uh, there, there are no counter effects or, or uh, competing effects here but that is not the problem with, that is not the case with the, the, the uh, flame speed there are competing effects that we have to worry about for how the flame speed changes as it approaches the rim. Uh, so it is not so straightforward so we consider that next. So how does the flame speed behave right there are two factors in fact two, two contravening factors that we have to think about one first and foremost as a matter of fact is the heat loss to the burner. heat loss to the burner. So when you now have a flame that is approaching the burner so think about what is happening uh, if you now have a burner rim that is look, looking like this when you are now trying to zoom in into the burner so much right you cannot simply draw a flame like a single line anymore pretending that that is going to now consume contain both your preheat zone and the reaction zone and all those things right. You now have to worry about how does the preheat zone look like, how does the reaction zone look like. 
what I know for a fact is far away from this burner rim, I'm going to have a certain thickness for the flame and the preheat zone is going to be thicker than the reaction zone, larger the activation energy, okay. But what happens as you now progressively come closer to the rim is keep in mind that this is actually the, the region where the temperature actually rises from the initial temperature to the flame temperature as we go along and this is the region where most of the conduction is happening. But as you now come down to the flame with the burner rim you now have a heat conduction that is going on inside the rim as well. So it is suddenly like the, the, the burner rim intruded into the preheat zone because the preheat zone essentially is part of where the conduction happens, right. But the preheat zone was supposed to actually heat up preheat, right. So preheat means it is supposed to heat up the reactants to react. So there is no point in heating up the burner rim because the burner rim is not hopefully going to react, right. It is kind of like the joke about whether we have, so how does the how does the combustor work? The combustor burns. <laughs> it's not good news because the combustor burns means the combustor is not going to be there. So similarly, you don't want to have the burner be part of the reactions, right? So what this what then happens is you now essentially are thinking about a a a thickening progressively thickening preheat zone, and the fact that we are talking about a heat loss is because the reactants are not the only ones that are getting heated up. In an adiabatic flame, there is a heat transfer going on. It's not. It's not as if like there is no heat transfer going on in an adiabatic flame. But it is kind of like you know the father gives his money to the son, and the son gives the money to the grandson, and so on. It, the, the, the money is kept within the family, right? It's not going going away. So it's like the reactants are are the ones that are actually getting the heat and reacting in the flame. So so long as the reactants are the ones that are going to get all the heat and then react in the flame to release that heat, it is an adiabatic system. But the moment the reactants are not the ones that are going to get heated up anymore, that is not an adiabatic system. So obviously then the local flame speed should decrease, right. So the, the flame essentially becomes a, a lot thicker and, uh, and the, flow, the flame speed progressively decreases to towards the, towards the uh, as the flame uh, is held closer and closer. So it is essentially the heat loss to the burner basically means that closer the flame base is located to the burner rim right more the heat loss and SL decreases more, right? The decrease in the SL is more. What we are basically thinking is as you now have a burner and you are now trying to increase the flame speed, we are beginning to imagine that the base is not exactly touching the rim anymore. The base of the flame is now going to go up a little bit and try to adjust its position. Why would it adjust is something that we are going to see pretty soon, right. But when it, with the moment we now begin to think that the flame is not going to be at, at the rim and, and can move up or down relative to the rim, what we are basically saying is closer it is to the rim more is the heat loss and therefore the flame speed near the rim is going to be progressively less. So this is a, a, a contribution that is going to decrease the flame speed. Okay, the second decrease the flame speed more and more when you are the flame is closer to the rim. Second is the um, mixing with the ambient mixing with the ambient, right? Now, for the purpose of what we are talking about. Let us fix the ambient as air, right, air as in what we find on earth here, right. That means you, you now have the oxidizing ambients, 
right? And then think about what happens as you as you now allow for mixing to happen. So essentially, what what this means is you now have more and more standoff of the flame. Let's say the flame is now further out. Okay. So if you now have a flame that is progressively further out and for this purpose it is sufficient for us to just draw a line to represent the flame let us not worry about its thickness right it is thicker and so on that is fine but what you are looking at is this distance more this distance greater is the mixing of the reactants with the ambient right what is the consequence of this for the flame speed that is really the question that we have to ask that depends on whether the flame is a fuel rich flame or a fuel lean flame right so if it were a fuel rich flame right so great so let us just record this greater the standoff distance right more is the mixing and the question is is that mixing going to be increasing the flame speed or decreasing the flame speed right so that depends on whether the flame is going to be fuel rich or fuel lean. So fuel rich flame in an oxidizing ambience what happens now this region actually becomes closer to stoichiometric right because it is a fuel, lean, fuel rich flame and then you are now sending in more oxygen from the side and therefore it becomes closer to stoichiometric. So this leads to a increase in flame speed right with increasing standoff right and this goes in the same direction as what the heat loss effect was. In the case of the heat loss what we understood was the closer the flame is to the burner lesser, it's, lesser, it is, it, lesser is its flame speed or conversely the farther it is from the burner it is going to have a higher flame speed because of less heat loss. This is exactly what we are saying here increase in the steam flame standoff means a increase in the flame speed because it is fuel rich. So in this case this is a little bit more complicated and we will talk about this later on. What is important for us to is to look at a competing effect that means an opposing effect right and that is presented in the case of a fuel lean flame. So in the case of a fuel lean flame you are already fuel lean and a greater mixing with the ambient is going to dilute the flame further and further right and that means the flame speed is going to decrease as the flame standoff distance increases. The heat loss was less so the flame speed does not have to decrease that much more but it is going to decrease because of the dilution right. So dilution decreases the SL with increase in standoff right. With these two we should now be able to tell how the flame is stabilized. We will do this now and uh, we will worry about pushing the limits on this to lead to a flashback or a blow off later. So essentially what happens is if you now have a let us now put these two together that means originally if you now had a, a flow velocity that was locally linear right and I am let me now consider the flame the flow like this right that is a flow velocity u. What we are looking for is if you now have a flame that is like this let us look at how its flame speed is going to be right. 
right? As it is over here with respect to like the free stream velocity, the flame speed is low, but the flow speed is actually decreasing linearly and the flame speed is decreasing because of heat loss on the one hand as its proximity to the burner is determined and because of the mixing and we are now considering a fuel lean case. Right. In the fuel lean case, it is more straightforward for us to think about. So there is a position, there is there is a condition when maybe maybe uh, the scales are not good here. So let us consider the scale that looks like that. So there is a condition when the local local velocity and the local flame speed match exactly, where you have this curvature facing the flow right so this is where you now have a u equals sl i'm not saying u bar uh, equals sl not or u not equals sl not okay i'm saying u is equal to sl so this is the stabilization condition right now what happens when you now try to actually have a flame that is perturbed inward is it now gets closer to the flame right so its SL actually becomes less than U because of a greater heat loss effect all right but the mixing is not much so it is not trying to decrease the SL a lot but the heat loss is actually trying to decrease the SL and therefore the flame gets pushed backwards to this point. But if you now try to actually have a uh, flame that is pushed further out, it now becomes a lot more extended. You can see how, we are, how I am drawing these pictures. You, you now see that it is actually stopping somewhere here, it is stopping here, it can extend further because your mixing fan is more. You're, you now have the, the reactants reaching a greater distance laterally outward, right. So you can, you can have a flame over here, but in this case, the SL actually now becomes greater than U because you do not have too much of a heat loss effect and therefore it has a tendency to move upstream. You now have a larger flame because the, the reactants have actually fanned out and they, they have less heat loss and they have a tendency to move against a linearly decreasing velocity until you reach a matching point. So effectively it now becomes a local match between a varying flame speed and a varying velocity. The flame speed is not uniformly varying, the, uh, uh, the velocity is linearly varying and this match is what is going to actually dictate how the flame is stabilized locally there and therefore correspondingly a flame standoff distance, stop here.